Um, given the number of people who responded to the session, we have clearly hit on a topic that's on a lot of people's minds. The idea of veracity of resources, of sources of information, and specifically how our students get their information and to what extent they are critical consumers of that information. And for today's panel, there are many ways we could have approached this topic. But what we're going to do today is to focus on what you can do with your students, the students you teach, or the students you advise, or the students that you work with in your offices. How can we help all of our students move a little bit further along in terms of being more critical consumers of information? And in order to accomplish that, each speaker is going to present for a short period of time because we wanted to leave the maximum amount of time for a Q&A so we can really respond to the questions that each of you have. So I'll introduce our speakers now. Uh, Amanda Click is one of our university librarians, and her expertise in terms of information literacy puts her in a very important position for today's conversation because she knows what students understand and what students don't understand about where their sources come from. So she'll be able to shine light on that. And on your table, there is a handout, excuse me, that says information literacy. It's a two-sided handout. If you would take a copy of that, please. Um, I think we need some more on this front table over here. Um, Angie Twang, Professor Twang, and Professor Joe Campbell are both from the School of Communication. And as journalists, and as communicators, and as researchers, they are in a perfect position, excuse me, they are in a perfect position to help us understand how students obtain information, how the media presents information, and how we can help our students to be more critical thinkers and um, consumers. So there's another flyer on your table that Professor Twain put together. There's a diagram that you'll refer to, and again, some tips for students. And Professor Campbell will be putting together uh, a handout after the meeting, which we often do because we don't know yet what it is that you are interested in hearing. So I think we'll just we'll just figure this out as we go along because lunch is still not ready. So Amanda, we'll do your presentation first, then we'll take a five minute break to gather lunch and then we'll come back. Amanda? Sounds good. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to kick this off by talking to you about information literacy and what that has to do with assessing sources in research. Um, the first thing that I would like to do is ask you by show of hands, who feels like they have a pretty good handle on what information literacy is? It's okay, be confident, be confident. I'm not gonna make you define it. <laughs> Um, okay, all right, so uh, the reason, one of the reasons I'm asking that is because I'm about to tell you what it means, and another reason is that uh, information literacy is actually one of the institutional learning outcomes here at AU, so it's a good thing to understand. So what is information literacy? This definition comes from the Association of College and Research Libraries. It was recently updated. Uh, in the last couple of years, we used, when, when I started as a librarian in 2008, we were using a slightly different definition, slightly different um, uh, uh, take on information literacy, but basically what you can see here is that we're talking about the ability to understand that you need information, find out, or, or uh, effectively find the information that you need, and then use that information. The, uh, the Association of College and Research Libraries used to use a set of standards related to information literacy. I'll give you a couple of examples of what those standards sounded like. Um, one was the information literate student determines the nature and extent of the information needed. So there's that idea of figuring out that you need information. The standard that would be most relevant to what we're talking about today is that the information literate student evaluates information and its sources critically and incorporates selected information into his or her knowledge base and value system. Now, uh, the, we have shifted away just recently from this set of standards to an information literacy framework. 
The information literacy framework is made up of these six frames, and these are threshold concepts. So that means that these are really core concepts that um, once they're understood, the learner has a, a, a new perspective on the discipline. So in this case, the discipline being information literacy. Um, so you can see several of these are related to what we're talking about today. The, this idea of, of evaluating, uh, of assessing sources. So this idea of authority, who wrote this? Who created this piece of information? Uh, the idea that information has value. So there we're talking about, uh, this includes the idea that a piece of information was created uh, to influence, perhaps. Uh, the idea of scholarship as conversation, that there's a back and forth uh, between scholars, between journalists, uh, talking about uh, a specific topic. You can see on your table, I have given you the, the uh, information literacy framework document. Well, well it's a one-page version of it. You don't really want to read the entire document, I don't think, this afternoon. But this kind of breaks it down into these different frames uh, and what they really mean. So uh, I want to go back in time a little bit and tell you, uh, well, librarians have been helping students evaluate the information that they find online ever since students were started to find information online. So uh, a, uh, one of the methods that has been used in the past and is still used today occasionally is called the CRAP test. Not to worry, it's an acronym. <laughs> and this is the CRAP test. So asking students to consider the piece of information they're looking at uh, in, in, these different, in these different frames, right? So currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. And you can see some of these are much easier to do than others, right? It's pretty quick to take a look at currency, see if there's a date, see if it's a recent date, check, okay? However, determining the accuracy of a piece of information, that is a much, that is a much more intense process, okay? So, uh, my take on the CRAP test at this point is it's still useful in some circumstances, but I really think that it's a little more complex now. It can't really be boiled down to just a checklist, all right? So what I'm proposing is that we train our students and also that we ourselves approach information that we find more from a perspective of kind of asking a series of questions. So we're reading an article, uh, we're reading a scholarly article, we're reading a news article that we find, found online, uh, and I want to approach this by kind of asking ourselves some questions. So there are a lot of questions that you could ask yourself, obviously. I think this is a good place to start. So uh, what, is the, what is the main idea of this article, okay? Was it obvious? Is the main idea, does it match the title of the article? Does this provide evidence for its claims? And are these, well, this slide says good sources, but I think I would, I would really say trusted sources. So is the article providing, uh, is it providing sources? Are they trusted? And do the sources that they provide actually support the claim that's being made? And if there are no sources cited, can I independently verify the claims in this article? Can I figure out by myself if these are true by finding other pieces of information? And then this, I think this is the most important question to ask. How does this information make me feel? Am I super angry as a result of reading this information? Or am I just desperate to believe that this information is true? So what is your emotional response? As I said, this is a good place to start. Uh, there's also, and I can have this posted on the website afterwards, the News Literacy Project provides a really good list of 10 questions to ask. And so we've got 10 questions here, starting with gauging your emotional reaction and ending with using a fact-checking site. And some of these questions have sub-questions. So how many articles do you read per day? How many pieces of information do you engage with online? And how often do you have time to ask yourself 10 questions about that piece of information? All the time, right? <laughs> so uh, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that I acknowledge that this is a big ask, OK? But it's also an important set of skills for us to develop and for us to teach our students. And as, as they are able, as we are able to develop this and, and, and become better at assessing these pieces of information that we're engaging with, then you learn to take shortcuts, right? You figure out the. Um, 
the, you understand this particular author's perspective. You understand where the, this publication is coming from. So uh, you get to the point where you can take these shortcuts. But in the beginning, uh, as, we're, as we're teaching our students to engage with information, it's really important to take the time and consider these issues. So let's talk about some things that you can do. You probably won't be surprised that my first suggestion is that you get in touch with the librarian. We can do a lot for you, okay? Um, and we are, we're good at this. I wanted to tell you, I wanted to read you a quote. I was reading an article, or an interview actually, with a computer science professor from Wellesley College. And this professor has created a system called uh, Twitter Trails that basically tracks the, the, um, tra uh, tracks the movement and the skepticism for claims that are made on Twitter, for claims, for memes, um, and, and tracks down the trails that these claims leave. It's really cool, Twitter Trails. I, I encourage you to look it up, Google it. Um, but what I wanted to share, you, share with you was a quote from this professor. He said, librarians are a critical group because they have formal <coughs> education in doing comprehensive research in a variety of domains and, could de and can detect misinformation more accurately than the average internet user. So you're probably not surprised to learn that I agree with that sentiment. <laughs> so uh, I wanna, I'll give you a couple examples of the things that our librarians do. Okay, um, our uh, Olivia Ivy, who is our public affairs librarian, she does a, an exercise with students where they are given a news article that's reporting on a study, okay? So, you know, every day there's a, there's a study, coffee does this, coffee's good for you, coffee's bad for you, red wine's good for you, it's bad for you. So students are given the news coverage of an article and then they're asked to backtrack. <laughs> they're asked to track down the original study and see where the claims in the article, in the newspaper, and where the claims in the original, and the findings of the original study match up, okay? So, following that trail. Uh, Rachel Borchard, who's our science librarian, does an exercise, uh, a flipped classroom style exercise, where students are asked to uh, watch a tutorial about finding, re doing research and finding resources, and then they come to class prepared to engage in a bibliography battle in which they are put in groups and asked to answer a question. For example, is BPA safe? And they put together a bibliography to answer that question. And Rachel and the professor work together to uh, choose a winner, basically, complete with prizes. So get in touch with the librarian. We're, 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 good, at, we're good at this, and we're, we are happy to help you. Uh, number two, promote library research. So I'm not advocating for anyone to uh, approach an information uncritically. But one of these little short shortcuts that I mentioned is doing, uh, asking your students to do their research through the library. And it, uh, as compared to the open web, it is more likely that this information has been vetted in some way. Uh, there has, there's been an editor, there's been peer review, okay? I'm sure a lot of you are already doing this, but I just wanted to lay out exactly why I think it's important. Also, talk to your students about confirmation bias and echo cham chambers and be aware of your own. Make sure that you're, when you're talking about students doing research, uh, either online or, on the, or uh, on the open web or through library resources, make sure they're thinking about these issues, okay? This information doesn't exist in a vacuum and uh, it, it's, really hard, it's really hard to check your own bias. And then finally, provide resources to help students evaluate sources. Here are some things that I really like and that I use regularly. Uh, this is online, so you can check. So these will be linked um, on the CTR website. These are mostly fact-checking uh, places for fact-checking websites to use. But I really want to point out this All Sides, which I think is a pretty neat resource uh, that I use a lot when I realize that my um, social media echo chamber is like only showing me the Huffington Post. Uh, All Sides is a good place where, it, it's a good place to go to kind of see how, see a, a wider variety of coverage on a spe specific topic, all right? So you're looking for the news coverage on this specific issue, and uh, All Sides will show you how, you know, Breitbart, CNN, and Huffington Post are covering it. So it's a good way to help students kind of think critically about the information that they're getting. Okay, I'm going to wrap that up for now. And I look forward to talking to you guys more about these issues during the Q&A. Hi. Okay. Thank you so much for um, 
coming to this session, and I think this is an important conversation to have, especially now. Uh, just a little bit about my background. I don't have a PowerPoint, but my handout is at your tables. It's the one that says verifying or researching a, a news or news story. So I came to American University in 2007 from a 13-year reporting career at three different newspapers, the Hartford Current, the Los Angeles Times, and the Oregonian. And so my practice of verifying news was done in a way that was not only practical, but survival driven. That um, as a news reporter, all I had was my credibility. And getting something wrong was not only incredibly embarrassing and damaging to my reputation, but most newspapers actually keep track of how many times you mess up and you lose your job if you have too many corrections. And so there was one newspaper, not one that I was employed by, that had a corrections court where reporters who had to cor have facts corrected had to go testify in court and, um, and be sentenced. And so that always sort of, I always had that in my head and it put, um, it put the fear of um, the correction in my head. Um, so what I'm offering to you is some tips that I share with my students when they are both reporting news stories of their own and also uh, verifying information for courses that are research driven or, um, or media analysis driven. And I think they could really work, I'm, I'm, I'm using language and um, categories that are relevant to journalistic media, but they could well work for any number of sources. Uh, one of the sources that we're looking at now in, I'm the curriculum designer for AUX2, the, um, the pilot freshman core curriculum on race and social identity issues. And one of the things we've been looking at in class is examining high school history textbooks and how they teach things like Manifest Destiny and uh, Native American uh, removal and, or, or not teach that. Um, and we've been looking at um, sources which teach students American history and, and asking many of these questions. So um, I'm going to offer these both as um, a tool which, with which you can verify information, your students can verify information. It's also a good basis for an interactive in-class exercise. So I've, I've used lists like these to have students look at particular news stories. Um, they tend to like stories that are very um, controversial, talked about. One of the best discussions I had with a sophomore writing class was about the Sean Penn interview of El Chapo uh, in Rolling Stone. I think that was Rolling Stone, yeah. And the UVA um, um, sexual assault story was another one that students really had a, had a very um, engaged discussion on. And um, sometimes I'll invite students to look up their own story. So here's a topic I'm really interested in, um, in Syrian refugees and, um, and the trials that they faced um, crossing seas and, um, and trying to get to safer ground. So I'm going to look up three different kinds of media. I'll look up um, a US media source, an international media source, and what we call ethnic or diasporic media. So maybe the uh, Muslim link in out of College Park, Maryland would be a good source to look at that topic and then we examine how each of them approach the topic differently. Um, other, other ways to look at this would be to have students find on a single news story one of each of the categories in the bullet points. So can you find, can you do your own research and find a story that you consider mainstream? You find a story that you consider advocacy journalism. You find a story that you consider more propaganda driven or, um, or uh, suspect in its use of facts and then make your arguments for why you think they belong in that category. And I think the other thing I want to emphasize is that this is a critical discussion. There are, not, there are no set of questions that will give you the bona fide definition of which category these stories belong in or what is where you draw the line at an acceptable source or not. That what I like to do is turn the question back to the students and have them wrestle with these gray areas and bring their own biases to the table and be transparent about them. Uh, one of the most interesting discussions I used to have before some of these other news sources became more prominent was, um, is Fox News 
and MSNBC, are they equally biased, right? And it, people get very passionate about this. And um, I think it's more not to say we're having this debate because we want one side to win, but we're having this discussion and using fact-based examples because we need to learn how to have this critical discussion, not only for our information literacy, but also just to learn to get along across political lines. That if we can have the discussion in a fact-based, civil way, which we bring evidence to the table, it's much better than arguing it very emotionally, which is what tends to happen when, when not, um, not given a, a classroom structure. So I'll, um, oh, and then um, this was not part of my presentation, but um, the, um, the bibliography challenge uh, reminded me of a game that my students love to play, which is called, um, or at least they tell me they love to play it, which is called the, uh, fact, the fact checking game. And all, I make it like a game show, and all we do is I give them intentionally sort of controversial um, rumors or facts that I make up. So one of them I say, um, you know, I make up a name. Senator so-and-so allegedly has put up a picture of his uh, grandfather as a Klansman in his office. And then the students are challenged to get into groups, and um, they need to come up with as many acceptable ways to fact check that as they can. As, as a journalist, so you can call a staffer, you can uh, look up other news stories, you can ask other senators, you can um, look up um, pictures that have been taken by photojournalists of the office um, and see if you can see what's on the wall. Uh, the one that students, and then it's, it's played like if you've ever played categories where you cancel each other out if you have the same thing. So, so their challenge is to keep coming up with um, more original ways to fact check. And the goal of it is, is at the end, I say, well, which one of these is the best way? And what students need to conclude from the exercise is that you really need to use more than one. That there is no one best way. It's the multiplicity of all those fact checking. So for the senator one, the one that they least often get, or the one that usually ends up winning that category is make an appointment with the senator and meet him in his office and look on the wall and ask him about it. <laughs> and so it's, it's, um, it's fun to let them uh, challenge themselves and um, use problem-based learning and a, a, a bit of competition to, to um, challenge themselves to think about it more broadly. And then when they get something wrong on their next story, I'll say, well, do you, rem do you remember the fact-checking game? Did you try as many, um, as many methods of fact-checking the story as we, we practice in the game? And the answer is usually no. Um, so um, this list uh, would be if you were looking at a particular uh, piece of journalism. And they're pretty basic questions. I won't go through and read every single one, but. What I'm most interested about um, students exploring and, and personally exploring when I look at a piece of journalism is um, what organization is publishing the story? Which sounds obvious, but I think nowadays we have a lot of sites where they appear to be something like the Denver News, but it's, it's a front for um, a true fake news site, a propaganda-driven site meant to mislead you or confuse you. And so, I think just um, looking at what the organization is and what can I learn about this organization independently of its own website or its own publications. So I think students default when I ask them the question is to go to the about page and re recite that information. And how can we independently verify what the reputation of this site is and what else they've done um, and this is where, you know, we've all taught our students to avoid Wikipedia. And I say, go to Wikipedia and see what's said on Wikipedia about this news site. Because what you have there is a consensus-driven, crowdsourced debate about what this site is. And, um, you know, don't, don't cite it in a research paper, but this is a start. This is a place where you could start to see what other people are saying about it in, a, in an expedient way. Uh, then um, we talked about the different categories, and again, these can be very slippery. It may be very hard to get students to agree on what the difference between advocacy journalism and propaganda is. But the debate is what's more important to me than necessarily always arriving at the same answers. Um, 
and uh, what, source, what sourcing is used. So these are the individual people and experts and studies that are quoted. What have they chosen? Um, do a source audit and take um, news articles and track on a spreadsheet which sources are appearing, who they are, what is their race, gender, affiliation, occupation, uh, geographical location, as much as you can find this, and, um, and then track the patterns over time. Uh, I participated, I designed a study for National Public Radio in which we looked at, over three fiscal years, about 8,000 news stories with a team and tracked all of those factors to figure out what was the makeup and the breakdown in, in sources that NPR was using. And the results were totally fascinating, but I can't, um, I would uh, be taking up too much time to, to um, tell you what they were. But um, very enlightening if you do it um, with any of uh, the media sources that are being used in your class or that you're personally using. Uh, then um, I think the most important is, can I verify it elsewhere? Who else is covering it? If, if this story is only being reported by one media organization and I can't find it anywhere else, even after the breaking news comes out, things happen so fast now, why is that? Or if people are reporting something different than what this one organization is reporting, why is that? And so those are all very interesting case studies. Um, and then I just want to point your attention to this chart. Um, and um, this is one that uh, became viral on, um, initially on Imager. And I will make no claims to the, um, the consensus or the accuracy of this chart. Um, I tend to think it's thoughtful and agree with some of it. It was created by an attorney who just was frustrated about people's um, lack of critical thinking about sources. And she just designed it herself, uh, didn't really source it or ask other people, put it online on her own blog, and it got picked up and has gone completely viral. And I think even telling students that story and then reading her own blog about why she wrote it is even a good meta exercise in in information literacy. And I would say, take a look at this chart and decide if you agree with it or not. And if you disagree with it, look up the sites that um, she's labeling as not reliable and make an argument for why they're reliable. Uh, make your own chart based on the media that you read and uh, map it out on these axes. The axes being um, uh, liberal, conservative, and complex uh, down to sensationalist or clickbait. And, um, and look at each individual element of the story. Headlines are different than, um, than leads. Leads are often different than the body of the story, especially with clickbait and, and, um, and fake news stories, and are often written by different people. The photos are generally captioned and, um, and um, uh, produced by people other than the people writing it. And so just be aware of all of those different elements. So I hope that's a good um, sort of uh, crash course primer on, on looking at news, and I'm happy to discuss more and answer questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, can everyone see me okay? Just in case you're wondering, I'm six feet seven. Yes, I used to play basketball. Yes, I used to be pretty good. Yes, I believe I'm the tallest guy on the AU faculty. I may be, anyway. I'm certainly the tallest faculty member in the School of Communication, and I'm delighted to be here. It's a great turnout today, and uh, thank you very much to CTRL, um, Marilyn, Naomi, uh, Anna, for the invitation and for the preparations that went into today's conversation. I did, by the way, have a handout, and it's, uh, it's uh, it, well, self-promotion, but nonetheless, what the heck. Uh, it's about uh, my latest, actually the second edition of my book about media-driven myths called Getting It Wrong. It's an essential resource, let me say, in a time of fake news. So, uh, let's get going here. I think a conversation today should not ignore the... Um, Mainstream media, mainstream media, well-known, nationally renowned mainstream media, traditional media. So, um, no, the mainstream media did not cause this to happen. It was not 
the fact of Chicago Tribune or any like mainstream media that uh, misreported the fiasco the other night at the Oscars. But nonetheless, as I say, I think it's important to keep in mind that the mainstream media should not be overlooked either. And there's good reason for this. There's good reason for this because the Gallup organization, which routinely asks Americans a lot of questions, one of them they ask regularly is how much faith and confidence do you have in the news media to get the story right? How much faith and confidence do you have in the news media to be fair about what they're reporting? And the Gallup organization in September found that less than a third of Americans responding to the poll have a great deal or a fair amount of confidence in the mass media to get the story right, to get it fairly, accurately, well reported. This figure has dropped off dramatically in the 20 years that Gallup has routinely asked this question. And even earlier, in the 70s, this number was much higher. Now it's dropped to 32%, less than a third. And, you know, frankly, there are good reasons why public faith, confidence, and trust in the media is at an all-time low. Just recently, there have been a number of stories that have come out that have been wrong, have had to been retracted, have had to be, I don't know, modified in some respects. Let's just run through a few of them very quickly. One is this notion that the Soviets, the Russians, I'm sorry, had penetrated the American electrical grid and were doing bad things about the American electrical grid. This story appeared first in the Washington Post, and it subsequently had to roll back the story because it was not a Russian penetration of the American electrical grid. It was one piece of malware found on one laptop computer of one employee at one electrical utility in New England. Far from a serious penetration by the Russians of the American electrical grid. Similarly, the notion, this is a Time Magazine report that Martin Luther King's bust had been removed from the Oval Office on the first day of the Trump administration. Turned out to be wrong. The Time reporter did not notice, did not care to check around, did not ask officials about what happened to the Martin Luther King bust. The story had to be retracted, and it is cited often these days by the Trump administration and its supporters as an example of the media's engaging in fake news. And also, just a few weeks ago, the Associated Press reported that the Trump administration was considering a proposal to deploy 100,000 National Guardsmen to remove millions of unauthorized immigrants from the United States. It turns out, as the Associated Press noted in a rollback article, no proposal, no serious discussions, never reached the highest level of the Department of Homeland Security. It was a story that caused them a lot of embarrassment. So there's good reason why the public is not really confident about the news media and their ability to get it right. And maybe these examples are not so surprising after all, because some of the most cherished stories in American journalism, some of the most cherished stories that journalists tell about themselves and their exploits and their professions are media myths. <laughs> these include the notion that the reporting team of Woodward and Bernstein brought down Richard Nixon's corrupt presidency in 1974. Their forces and factors that led to Nixon's resignation were far more significant and far more important and typically were subpoena-wielding than Woodward and Bernstein. In fact, Richard Nixon probably would have survived the scandal of Watergate had it not been for his audio tapes. His own words did in Richard Nixon. They captured him approving a plan to have the FBI called off on the initial Watergate investigation in June of 1972, shortly after the seminal crime of that scandal, the break-in of Democratic National Headquarters at the Watergate. Similarly, the Walter Cronkite moment of 1968. Walter Cronkite's declaration on air that the US military effort in Vietnam was mired in stalemate, supposedly swung public opinion against the war and caused Lyndon Johnson to understand that his war policy in Vietnam was a shambles. Public opinion, in fact, had begun turning against the war months before Walter Cronkite took to the air to declare the U.S. is mired in stalemate in Vietnam. Plus, the word stalemate had been echoing around the media for months before Cronkite used it at the end of February 1968. And Lyndon Johnson did not see the program when it aired. He was at a black tie birthday party in Austin, Texas for a longtime political ally, John Connolly, then governor of the state. 
It's hard to see, hard to imagine how the president could have been much moved by a TV show he didn't see. And finally, in this lineup of sherry stories that aren't true, the notion that Edward R. Murrow stopped in the, in the tracks of <coughs> Joseph R. McCarthy, the communist and government witch hunt that McCarthy had been going on for several years. The report that aired in March 1954 by Edward R. Murrow came months, if not years later than most journalists had been out there attacking McCarthy for his exaggerations, his lies, and so forth. Murrow's program that night did not stop McCarthy. McCarthy's favorability ratings had been in decline months before Murrow's program. So those are some of the examples of cherished stories that journalists tell about themselves that really are media myths. Frankly, journalists love to think of themselves and the profession <laughs> as telling truth to power, as at the vital center of major events and developments, such as the Watergate scandal. But it's true that mainstream media, given their reach, given their prominence, really do and can set a media agenda far more readily. They can set this agenda, this news setting agenda, far more readily than extremist websites, for example. So I think there's good reason to encourage your students to treat traditional media with a fair amount of skepticism. The media are everywhere. There's no doubt about it. But ubiquity does not translate into infallibility. Far from it. Don't assume that traditional media, that the best names in American journalism, are always going to get it right. They don't. Not always. So here are a few other straightforward suggestions, practical suggestions that I would offer to you. One is to hone an ability to develop the sniff test. What the heck is the sniff test? It's not related to the crap test. <laughs> not that I know of. It's like when you open the door of a refrigerator and, whew, something doesn't smell quite right. That cheese is going bad, whatever, the milk is turned. The sniff test is when a story doesn't sound quite right. It doesn't smell quite right. When you use your common sense and it says, hmm, there's probably something more to this story than what's being reported right now. This doesn't seem to be quite accurate. So encourage students to hone an ability to employ the sniff test, to use their common sense in treating stories. And if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Or at very least, it needs to be checked out further. Be wary of anonymous sources, stories that have a lot or exclusively rely upon unnamed sources. Often they're identified as US officials or administration officials. Stories built around anonymous sources are frequent in Washington, but they often are in error. They should raise a red flag. And one example that I love to share about this use of anonymous sources that can get a news organization into big trouble was the case of Jessica Lynch. Jessica Lynch was a 19-year-old waif-like army supply clerk whom the Washington Post vaulted into international fame and renown because the Post said in an electrifying front page story early in the Iraq war that Jessica Lynch was fighting fiercely in an ambush of her unit in Nazaria in Iraq, in southern Iraq. That Jessica Lynch, despite being shot and stabbed herself, was firing and attacking Iraqis despite the fact that her comrades were dying and falling wounded all around her. It was a tremendous story, picked up by news organizations around the world. None of it was true. Jessica Lynch did not fire a shot in Iraq in that ambush. Her weapon had jammed. She was not shot. She wasn't stabbed. She suffered severe injuries in the crash of a Humvee that she was riding and tried to escape the ambush. The story was wrong in all important elements. And it was built around unidentified US officials. So if there was ever an anonymous source-based story that should have been and deserved to be questioned at the highest levels of the Post and elsewhere, it was this tale about Jessica Lynch and how she was fighting to the death. None of it was true. This has been mentioned before by Angie. 
Uh, check your biases. Cultivate viewpoint diversity. I think this is very important for students to be able to be encouraged to do because the media don't always sing from the same hymnal. There are a variety of sources out there. Intellectual, political diversity exists in the mainstream media. And this is really an encouragement to think critically, to think imaginatively about the sources and the news that is being consumed by, by Americans, by American audiences. Cultivate viewpoint diversity. So season your diet of the New York Times with the Wall Street Journal's editorial page. Check out the Washington Post, but also maybe, maybe the Washington Times. And don't be fooled by satire. Be surprised how often this happens. There are satire sites out there. The Onion is one of them. Andy Borowitz, writing for The New Yorker, is another. And sometimes this satire sounds almost too good not to be true. And it's picked up on social media and by other mainstream media on occasion and treated as if it were accurate as if it were true. One example that comes to mind is Andy Borowitz's column about a month ago in which he said the extravagant use of alternative facts in the Trump administration had led to 10 million jobs being created for fact checkers. <laughs> Clearly satiric, but nonetheless something to be mindful of. So briefly, to recap, five practical suggestions. You can do this easily. You can have your students do it fairly easily too. Don't assume the mainstream media is going to get it right. The best names in journalism sometimes do get it wrong, as we've seen. Hone an ability to employ, employ that sniff test. If it doesn't seem quite right, there might be something wrong with it. Be wary of anonymous sources, particularly stories, news stories that are built around the use of unnamed officials and the like. Red flag. Cultivate an exposure to viewpoint diversity, really vital in being able to test your viewpoints against others. And finally, don't be fooled by satire in the media. And I'll close with another Borowitz example. This one really got some traction. He claimed that after the election, he wrote a, a piece after the election that said that Trump for the first time had Googled Obamacare. And in doing so, found out there was a good deal of stuff in there that he, he was surprised to find, and they might find it you know, very useful to, to, to keep. Uh, this story was, I don't know if it went viral on social media, but it sure got a lot of pickup. It got a lot of traction on social media. So my many thanks for your attention, and I'd be happy to uh, field questions as they arise. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you to our speakers. Uh, we're going to take questions now. Um, so you can either ask to, to your question to a specific person on the panel or just in general. Um, just a real simple question. How do you actually crack the confirmation bias? Good question. Crack it, you say? Yeah. Break it open. Get rid of it. Destroy it. Well, you Whatever. start You start with viewpoint diversity. I mean, engaging and in, 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 uh, honing a taste for examining sources beyond just the ones that you're comfortable with. I think that that's a, that's a start. That certainly is a start. But it's unconscious, isn't it? Oh, maybe. Mm -hmm. I think if you deep down, you think about it, yeah, you probably recognize that you're engaging in that. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, if it's so uh, subconscious as that. I think if you look at journalistic stories as um, a sum of their elements, so you start breaking it down and saying, what sources are quoted here, who is funding this organization, who are the people who are on the masthead or on the editorial board, and just really invite either students or yourself to look at that critically as a researcher and look at each piece of media as a amalgamation of different elements and different um, people and minds and, and, um, and funders. We also know that our students get a lot of their information from Facebook. So if they're constantly checking with their friends, people that they trust, and people whose points of view are similar to theirs, that's a kind of confirmation bias too. They're constantly being confirmed that their point of view is good. So the idea of having students read something that's not coming from someone who believes the same thing they do. Amanda, you want to add to that? Well, I, I, just think, I think this idea of looking at, making sure that you're approaching the, the diversity of sources, basically, looking at the same story from different angles, um, and 
uh, making sure that you're considering the way the different ways that it's being covered. Does that help, or do you, you still seem to have some reservations about? Well, it's just it's, it's easy to say that that's what you do, and it's really hard to. I think it's very hard to actually get people to to do that to be so self-aware. Yeah, and, know, and, in and aware of aware of my biases. I mean, I I have to check myself. I, the, this controversy has actually made me very attuned to the biases that I have and that I read. Well, I think um, that's a good point. It's hard. It's not easy, and it's a con it's a constant exercise. It requires constant vigilance. And that's one step. I mean, recognizing the, recognizing one's own biases and and. Uh, but I think I think bringing them into the classroom assignments that that can encourage variety of views, viewpoint, political diversity. I think that that's that, that is not difficult to do. Yes, thank you. Um, it seems to me that we're conflating two things here. On one hand, we're talking about dealing with students and trying to enforce, a, you know, good common sense self discipline when they're doing research within an academic setting. Okay, then there's the issue of how students and all of us deal with information flow coming to us in the real world, okay, outside of, uh, you know, a, a limited academic setting. Uh, and, and it seems to me the latter is, is far, far, far more problematic situation uh, in terms of dealing with those issues. And Professor Campbell, I mean, you touched on a lot of that. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't share your optimism, because I'm familiar with Brendan Nyhan's work, which I suspect you are, at, I, think he's, I think he's at Dartmouth, um, uh, who has written about the death panels controversy and, you know, how that took hold, that whole, that whole thing. Um, and um, a number of, also the, um, the issue of trying to, the, this, this the experiment he ran with um, dealing with Fox News viewers and trying to get them to accept factual information about climate change and how the result mainly was to get them to actually dig in their heels more, the, the back, so-called backfire effect. Um, so I'm, I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at here is, are you, is your, is, is and anybody can answer this, is, is your concern that the habits that we're all getting into, and particularly students, 45% of Americans getting their news from, uh, from Facebook, and we know what that means in terms of confirmation bias, um, that that is then spilling over heavily into what students do academically? I don't. I don't know if it if it is. I mean, I think the uh, the panel, at least the subtitle here, is judging the veracity of sources and information. And it was it was in a media context rather than than how to do uh, solid academic research. So um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think it's spilling over into into other areas. I think our focus has been largely on readily accessible news and information and news sites. So, uh, and there's lots of them, as I say, and, and not all of them are singing from the same side of the political aisle. And that's one thing I'm encouraging people to, to recognize that and to engage in, indulge in, if you will, um, this viewpoint diversity. I think we have a lot more control over the former, which is to give students structured exercises and practices in the classroom than we have over what they do on their own time. And I think that one should lead to the other if, if it's done right. It doesn't mean that every single time they'll practice going through a checklist, but that the awareness that things like confirmation bias, like media bias, like, like their own sort of bubble effect, filter bubble with, with their social media, just discussing the existence of that, I think is an important step of awareness. And what they do with it, like um, any of the other skills we teach them, is um, essentially up to them and may not fully take effect until later on in their life or, or at all. I liken it to teaching students good grammar and they may still, um, you know, text their friends in, in all emojis and abbreviations and um, incomplete words, but at least we introduce them to the idea that good grammar exists. I mean, I think, and it depends a lot, too, on the assignments being or students are being given and the discipline in which they're working. So I'm the business librarian and the students that I work with, you know, they do plenty of their work plenty of their research through library resources using our databases, but then there are some questions that really have to be explored on the open web, right? So they're doing both. They're, they're both having kind of that shortcut of using these, these um, recommended resource, resources, but also having to uh, judge the value of things that they find just Googling. Yeah, I think, I think it comes down to um, 
encouraging good media hygiene. And uh, should I say the crap test is part of that? <laughs> part of it too is naming and framing this conversation in your courses. We don't expect that in every single class you're going to accomplish all of the things that have been mentioned today. But even having a conversation with students at the beginning of the semester by asking them, where do you get your news? I was at a program yesterday at SOC, Scott Talon's class, and the first question that the panelists asked the students in the room was, how do you get your news? So even just starting with that and having the conversation of what does confirmation bias mean to you? What does the veracity mean? How, how do you do this can really start the conversation. And that's a small step, but if everybody started doing that, it would make a difference. I would also say modeling good media consumption behavior to your students. So when I bring in articles in the classroom, I'm very careful about bringing in articles from a variety of sources and, um, and not always bringing in the same media outlet. Sometimes I um, just, a big news event ha happens and we go around the room and say, how did I first learn about this? And I'll be really honest about how I first learned about it, but then I'll say, well, I saw it on my Twitter feed and then the next step I took was this because I wanted to confirm this. And just couching it in personal terms and saying, you're, I don't even tell them I'm modeling good media consumption, but just um, offering that. Or I had to check my own biases when I read this article. And I think students appreciate being able to relate to, um, to us, believe it or not. Yes. This sort of reminds me of that. another point that was made. How does this, how does this make me feel? That was on someone's bullet point. And to me, that then gets to maybe um, the bias. Because if it makes me happy, then that must be a, a clue that I'm biased towards this. Uh -huh. If it makes me mad, does that, is that an accurate indicator? Uh, yeah, yes, I think that, that makes a lot of sense, right? So if you are, I think that's a, a, an important step in identifying your biases is gauging your emotional reaction, uh, especially if it's particularly extreme, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that definitely makes sense. But related to that same question of um, the emotional reaction and how it will help you identify your own bias, I was also wondering, is it also about the analytical process of what is this purpose, like what are they trying to do to me and how are they trying to influence me? Yes. That, I, I read it more on that side as in. Yes, yes, certainly. And, and then that leads to questions about uh, the author's purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're mm -hmm. saying, and you know, who's paying for this? Um, what does the, what does, is the author trying to uh, inform me or trying to convince me? But all, looking at all those questions about, and this all feeds into that idea of authority being contextual and uh, acknowledging that someone who is an expert um, to one group of people in one field may not be considered to be an expert to another group of people in another discipline. You, you know, the, the, um, one of the normative values in, in uh, American journalism, even to this day, is that you know, we're not necessarily trying to, again, it's normative, we're not trying to influence people. We're not telling them how to think. We're telling them what to think about. So, I mean, that's probably, you know, sounds a little naive, but nonetheless, that's how journalism students are instructed these days, how, how mainstream journalists sort of go about their work, that they're not trying to influence people. They're just trying to present the facts, present the news, and leaving the uh, editorial commentary to the editorial page and to columnists. Now, you know, whether they indeed do that, I mean, at least that, that's the fundamental baseline objective that they pursue their uh, metier with. Yes. Dr. Campbell, um, so uh, what do you think, uh, you know, the Mr. Trump said anonymous source is kind of like a fake, uh, you know. So what if the, the people come up and ask, so he has a reason to say the news, you know, without mentioning any sources could be considered as a fake news. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's pretty uh pretty crude uh and and ugly, but nonetheless, you know, journalism is a, is is not beanbag. It's a tough business and and uh journalists should be expected to be 
criticized and and they should be able to take it. And I, I think this is not necessarily new. The extremes may be a bit new, but there have been administrations going back, boy, I don't know, to Lincoln's time or before, in which there's been a lot of aggressive pushback about media messages. And in the historical context, this is this is not new. What is perhaps new, as I say, is, is, the, extreme, is the extreme to which Trump may be going on some of these issues, but uh, and, and calling the media the enemy of the people and so forth. But um, the, the 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 tension and the and the um, assaults between the media and the presidency is is not new. And and I think that's an important component to to make clear to students too that, that what we're going through now, this is not novel. This is not original necessarily. We have precedents for a lot of this material. On anonymous sources, um, that's often a classroom debate I invite my journalism students to have about do you believe that anonymous sources should be used, and particularly policy and government reporting. And let's look at some examples of groundbreaking stories or important stories that relied on anonymous sources. The question I often ask is, why are the sources anonymous? Is it stated in the story why this person wanted to remain anonymous? How are they identified? What level of knowledge do we have about this person's closeness to the story or their expertise? Uh, there was a very interesting um, anonymously sourced story where the, um, the key source was listed as somebody with um, knowledge of Trump's way of thinking said. And I'm sure there was a tortured negotiation between the source and the reporter on this, but to me, that's not, that's not a helpful anonymous source label um, for me to judge the veracity of that source, but it was used by the New York Times. And um, the number of anonymous sources. So to me, a story that is based on 19 anonymous sources that are specifically identified in their role and it's explained why they're anonymous is different than a story based on one anonymous source that's sort of vague. Yes, John. <laughs> Hi, thank you for this. Th thanks, thank you for this. I don't know how to form this into a question, but occasionally, and it's rare, we'll find ourselves in a classroom situation where a student is um, operating on faith about something, whether religious faith or political faith. And the student is, how shall I put it, wrong. But to simply assert that will invite the student to say, well, that's you know, your bias, you know, and so sure, I have my own, but I'm pretty sure the dinosaurs coexisted with Neanderthal man. I don't, that's a, that's a minefield in the classroom in that moment. Um, so form that into a question and help us out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can question. actually say that at, at one point, in one version of my recommendations, I actually had a line that was something to the effect of opinion is not fact. Uh, and then I thought, Boy, that's really complicated. <laughs> Maybe I'll take that off the slide and see if it comes up. <laughs> so, so thanks. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I don't know what to say to that besides that's an opportunity for a conversation in the classroom about what is faith, what is opinion, what is fact. Um, that whole conversation about, you know, are, are you entitled to your opinion when your opinion is just based on falsehoods? It's complicated. I would, I, would, I would not take it up in the classroom. I would speak with the student, make a point of speaking to the student afterwards, keeping in mind that in the classroom, the power dynamic you know, flows to the professor. And geez, I think the last thing these days you want to do is to, is to call out a student whose beliefs may be inaccurate or uh, exaggerated or wild, but uh, I, I don't think necessarily the classroom setting is, a, is the best place to do that, at least on a one-on-one -on -one. Uh, setting. So I think I think after the class, uh, make, ask the student to make an appointment. You know, have a chat with him or her, and uh, I think that would be a, a far better recommendation than, than taking class time to to be diverted. Because it sounds like that scenario that you've just presented, John, would be a major diversion from 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 the day's session. I said I, I like the idea of sending people to sources with a different bias than they have, but I'm concerned about the fact that there's the issue of bias and there's also the issue of reliability. There are some sources that are not merely of a different bias, but are just you know, totally unreliable. 
And so I'm afraid that if people don't keep these two, this, this distinction in mind, going to an unreliable source that has a different point of view will actually only reinforce their own biases. They are, are, do you have examples? Do you have any examples in mind? I mean, th that does sound pretty abstract. Okay, well, I, <laughs> okay, fine. Um, uh, if, uh, if I wanted to, uh, because I'm, I have a bias, I'm Muslim, practicing Muslim, I have a bias towards Islam, so I want my students to be able to question their biases on either side of the issue. But I don't want them to go to Breitbart News if they're inclined, if they're, you know, if they're favorably inclined towards Islam and look for what it says about Islam and see things that are so patently absurd uh -huh. that they'll just say, okay, so the other side has nothing to say. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I don't think that's true. I think there are, there are interesting um, um, sites out there, websites, amalgamation sites. Um, Real Clear Politics comes to mind. They really try to toe uh, an even-handed approach to things. Same with uh, Real Clear World, which would give you a lot more of, a, of an international flavor. Real Clear Defense, Real Clear Policy, even Real Clear Books. And I think that, I mean, I have no association with Real Clear Politics or the, the whole site, but nonetheless, it seems to me that it's an example of how authoritative websites can, can offer variety of views, both if you will, left and right. I, I understand. My point is, though, apart, of, apart from giving the students particular sites to go to. Well, incorporate that material in the classroom. I think it's also important that um, one thing I, I teach my students about is the concept of false balance and how it's influenced media and become a increasingly common model in the post-1990s 24-hour cable news cycle in which it became a lot cheaper to put two talking heads who represented a pro and con side and do the he said, she said type argument than to actually report news and investigate and interview people. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a matter of pure economics, but we've come to become accustomed to this crossfire style debate. And when the issue is, is, Islam a force for good or not, that's not really, to me, that's a false balance argument, right? That um, to bring this, the other side of that story is, is, is not, there's no equal weighting of those two sides. And I think to make students aware that there are some things that they may dispute if they're um, the student who's operating on opinion or faith, but that I think you as the scholar in the room can say when it comes to, I, I would tell a class, when it comes to looking at the issue of climate change, I think to weigh a skeptic against um, the scientific community is false balance. And here's the evidence I can bring to that. Well, can I follow up on that? Because maybe that would have been a better example. Uh, there are scientists who are skeptical of climate change. And so if I want someone who is favorably disposed towards climate change to investigate the other side of the issue. I want them to go read a paper by uh, a scientist from the Harvard College Observatory uh, and not some, you know, someone who has no background and no knowledge and no opinion because if you read some, you know, pure, uh, an opinion pay, ba piece based on, on alternative facts, then it's only going to reinforce your belief in climate change. It's not going to cause you to question. But, 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 but well, ground, thing? Sure, Isn't ground. it an option for you as a professor to assign the two articles? I, I'm <laughs> is that too <laughs> simple an answer? No, I think it is because when I assign papers, I want them to do their own research. research. I don't want to tell them where to go, you know, which sources. I can give them, le I can give them start off sources. I can say start with this. But I don't want them to go and do their own digging. Okay. Sorry. No, I, 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 I would find, and they exist out there, I can't cite them, but uh, um, sources that, that do raise skepticism about climate change. And after all, science is an all ever-evolving field. I mean, there is no single right answer ever, and I think that that's an important element to keep in mind, too. Okay, we have time for one last question. Anybody? like in the classroom when you have wait time, eventually somebody says something. <laughs> Anybody have one last question? Yes, Lindsay. <laughs> it works every time. So um, a lot of the examples about what you do in class and sort of how you approach media bias or non-media media bias um, 
reporting, all of this, it makes a lot of sense in the context, uh, well, maybe in a lot of classes context, but specifically in SOC classes. Like, I want, as, as, a, as a citizen, I want my journalists to know all of this stuff in really great detail. Um, and so that's part of why they take so many courses in SOC. In other disciplines, how, how do you balance sort of the basic, what students need to know, their, their sort of information literacy pieces and how media operates pieces? How do you balance the content that they need to know to be able to do the kind of checklists that you are advocating for against all of the other stuff that they already have to bring to, all of the other content that they have to, to learn in whatever the other courses? So you're basically asking, um, how, how can we fit in information literacy skills when we have all this disciplinary content? Yeah, especially because I think some of the information literacy skills are content dependent, right? Like right. students won't know what sources are acceptable in their discipline until they know enough about their discipline what, to what understand. What authority means in their discipline and mm -hmm. value in their discipline. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so you're asking how to make this, how to create this balance? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, my answer, of course, would be to bring in your specialist librarian <laughs> um, to, you know, to, to support your, you know, you don't necessarily have to take, um, you know, classroom time to teach your students how to do research, um, how to evaluate these sources, etc. I mean, if the best you can do is make sure they know who their um, SOC librarian is, who their business librarian is, who their um, science librarian is, and that that person is there to um, support them in their research, then maybe that's the best you can do. Um, I often, when I go into classrooms, I often tell students that their their tuition pays my salary and that my I'm paid to help them in their research, and that's what I want to do. I want to do one-on-one -on -one appointments, and I want, instead of going in and demonstrating a database to an entire group of students who may or may not have an information need at that moment, I'd much rather sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and address your specific need. And then we're teaching those skills as they're needed. Uh, maybe this complicates the teaching process, but I don't treat any disciplinary source of information or text as truth with a capital T. And part of the process is asking students, okay, I am reading this because, um, or I am asking you to read this because there is a disciplinary consensus that this is important, respected. But let us ask, who is, who is writing this? What is this person's background? What might this person's biases be? What are the voices that would speak out against this particular way of processing this issue? What have people done in the past on this issue that have over time evolved or been, um, been revised, contradicted? And this works for scientific studies and scientific consensus as well as history. And I think that's just part of teaching students. It sometimes frustrates them and blows their minds. And for the students who are ready for it, it's really exciting for them to see, wow, everything that I was taught is not necessarily the gospel truth, that I can be a critical thinker about this. OK, thank you all for coming. Thank you to our panelists.